Hey, welcome back. If you remember, we left off last time talking about how the default plots from Vegan have a lot of information and we're able to show a lot about variation and multivariate data using those plots, but sometimes they can get kind of cluttered and they look like those old school base R graphics. So it'd be really great if we could use what we know about ggplot and using aesthetics and mapping in there to present our ordinations and the relationships among our sites and our species in a cleaner way. So that's what we're going to talk about now. I'm going to show you how we can use additional packages that others have created that operate on vegan objects to create ggplot style graphics for both cluster diagrams and ordinations. Now a bit of warning on this, these are external packages, they're not written by the tidyverse or ggplot people, they're not written by vegan people, they're just posted by other competent programmers on the internet. Both of these are relatively new to me and I'm not sure what their long-term maintenance is going to be, so a bit of a caveat on that in case the packages aren't available by the time you get to this, but should be good for you that are picking up early on this during the Corona team. So with that, let's go get started. Get started, of course, by loading up our packages. Tidyverse and Vegan, and now we're loading Grid Extra, which gives us an option for arranging different ggplot objects side by side, kind of like we did in that X11 window last time, but this is a much better way to do it in ggplot. We'll load the same varichem data and scale the selected variables, the same soil chemistry variables as before, being sure to set scale center equals false. And we'll fit a cluster diagram on the Euclidean distance matrix here because one of the first things that we're going to do is look at ggplotting different cluster diagrams. We have two add-on packages to do this. ggdendro and dendextend are two packages that have been developed to do cluster diagrams in ggplot. The first one, ggdendrogram, is pretty simple. It just replaces ggplot, and the rest of the call here is very similar to a regular ggplot. We've rotated it with chord, flip, and shut off some of the lines in the background to make it a little more clear, but it looks just like any of our other cluster diagrams. We can have more control over colors and other components of the graph using this other package, dend extend. And this is a good example of why it's useful for us to have familiarized ourselves with D plier pipes from the tidyverse. When I went and found this package, all the examples were with D plier pipes and knowing how to use those is critical in being able to adapt the example code from this package's help files and actually using it. So it's an example of how we use this package to modify some of the underlying components of the cluster diagram, converting it to a dendrogram, converting the colors and giving a, a numbers that we want for our different groups, or K. Remember, K means clustering. K is the term used for the number of groups. The formatting the line weight of the branches, and then we put it into ggplot, but at this point we have other options here that come from the package that we're using. So it looks a lot like a ggplot, but it's certainly not a default ggplot, but we are using other elements of the tidyverse to manipulate our data pour it in and format the resulting plot. So we'll take a look at that. 
And then we can just see the same horizontally oriented cluster diagram as before, but the different groups, the five different groups here are given different colors. And we can see the sites going down the side to show where each of these leaves end up and who's in what cluster. So that's just a quick introduction to what we can do to make our cluster diagrams fit a common theme maybe if we're going to use them with other graphs that we've made in ggplot in a report or thesis or paper. The main thing that we want to emphasize today, however, is making ordinations in ggplot. We'll get started just as we would before. We need to load the groups that we're going to use. These are the same made up groups for the Vericam data set as we used last time. We'll fit the same PCA using cap scale on the Euclidean distance matrix. And right away we will fit our vectors on our environmental data. We'll use the humus depth on the first three axes using nfit. This should all be familiar to you from what we did last time. And now we're going to extract the species scores from the PCA using the scores function and we're going to convert those to a tibble and pull the row names that would be in that scores object, convert those row names to a column called nutrient. You can use the scores function on an nfit object as well. Here, instead of saying site or species, we say vectors. Remember that a nfit object has both factors and vectors. So here we're just going to pull the scores out for the vectors and again convert it to a tibble and pull those row names out and call that the gradient. That ensures that our humus depth label comes into this scores data frame. Now for the convenience of working with these later, we're going to store these in a new type of R object that we haven't covered much, if at all, yet, and that is called a list. Let's just take a minute to explain. Let's just take a minute to describe what a list object is and how it relates to data frames. We haven't really ran into lists yet, so let's take a moment to talk about them. The basic two-dimensional data structure has columns and rows, and an R is simply known as a data frame or in tidyverse as a tibble. This is our CSV structure. This is how any data come from Excel. But in R, we can have another one with different columns, a different data frame in the environment, and heck, we can even have a third one stored in the same environment. Each of these three would be known as different objects. They would be their own data frames or, of course, tibbles. And if we wanted to refer to any particular column in there, we would call to the data frame, use the dollar sign to map to a specific column in the data frame. What if, though, these were all in a single object stored all together by one object name. This in R would be a list or in the tidyverse LST. And if we wanted to call to those, we can use the same structure with list, dollar sign, data frame, column. That's all one object in R. You can think about it as a workbook in Excel with different worksheets, or you can think about it as an old file folder, a manila folder with different sheets of paper inside it, but it's a single object in R that we can call each data frame and each column with dollar signs. And since we're trying to do as much as we can in the tidyverse, we're going to use the LST function to create a tibble type list. You could just have here LIST to create a base list. Here we're going to have two data frames, 
we're going to store the species scores from the PCA as that data frame called species in our list. And then we're going to have another data frame called vectors, which is the scores that we just pulled out of the nfit object and create this list called PCA scores. We can look at it and we see exactly that structure that we discussed above with the dollar sign mapping to the data frames, the Tibble data frames that have been stored. There's two dollar signs, meaning that there's two Tibble type data frames stored in this list. Each one of them has their own number of columns. Species data frame has the nutrient in the first two MDS because that's what was returned by the scores function to get the species scores out. The vectors data frame has gradient, which we created from the row names and the first three MDS scores, which was defined by that choices argument in nfit. There are a few packages that plot vegan objects as ggplot using some default wrapper functions. We're going to start with this package called ggortyplots. The main function in ggortyplots is ggortyplot, where we give it our vegan object. We define the groups just as we would in orty spider or orty hull or orty cluster. And then we have several arguments that need a response. We want to shut off ellipse. I believe that's the default, so we make that false. We want to see spiders, so we make spiders true. And we do want to see the plot here, so we make plot equals true, and then we call that. Now when we compare this to a default plot from vegan, it is, in my opinion, substantially improved. We see the default ggplot background. We get a legend for our groups. The colors have been automatically assigned and we have information about how much is explained by each of our axes on the axis labels with MDS1 explaining 46% of variation and MDS2 explaining almost 26% of variation. So as far as default plots go, this one's pretty nice. So what we can do to override some of those defaults and make our own graph having more control over the aesthetics and the different information layers present is we can save that ggortyplot object as an R object with plot equals false. We don't need to define whether the spiders or the ellipses are true or false because that object actually contains them all. The true and the false arguments apply to when plot equals true and what that call should show us. But when plot is false, we're just going to store all of that information in this PCA GG object. And now what we can do is pull out the scores for the spider plots from that PCA object. The data frame in there is called DF spiders. We're going to rename the default X and Y labels as MDS1 and MDS2 to be consistent with the scores that we've gotten from the vegan objects. And we're going to store that in the same PCA scores list as a data frame called spiders. And we can look at our list again and see spiders has been added as a third data frame in this list of three. It has five columns beginning with the group. These are the centroids of those groups. You'll see that fall is the first group. There are five instances of fall burns. So the first five values in these centroid columns are going to be the same. But then in 
MDS1 and MDS2, each observation has different values because these are the endpoints of those spiders. So we're going to use ggplot to connect these centroids to these outlying points by the three different burn seasons. To get started with this, we just create a essentially empty ggplot that has a lot of the formatting that we expect to see with ordinations. ggplot by default gives us this gray background and horizontal and vertical lines given as negative space with white lines on the gray background. We're not used to seeing ordinations like that, so we're going to turn that off with the theme black and white and then remove the panel grids down in this call to the theme. We're also going to add dotted lines that go through the origin so that we can better center the ordination in our eye when we look at it and see where the periphery is. So go far away from the cross of these two dotted lines just as we've seen in all the other biplots. So we're just going to define that empty ordination plot as ord gg and then we can add to that we're going to add the site scores here which have been stored in the as the outer points of the spiders from that gg ordi plot object that we stored in our list so here the data includes our list and then we tell it which data frame we want to go to and then beyond there, we can still just use these names of the columns because the data is being read as this specific data frame in the list. So this is a pretty clean scatter plot. You can see our custom axes and how we've cleared out the background. You can see the dotted lines we've put in at the, to meet the origin, the horizontal line and vertical line at zero and zero and then we see the site scores plotted as different colors in this case different symbols for each of our groups we can easily add our environmental vector we're going to use geom segment which has an arrow function to give us that arrow vector that we saw in our tri plots from the default vegan plotting last time Again, we re in the data argument refers to the same list, but now to the vectors data frame. The origin, of course, is 0, 0, so we can just fix that for x and y. And then the other arguments in the aesthetics for geom segment show where the line needs to be drawn to. So we'll map to x, we'll map x end, which is where the horizontal axis needs to end, will be MDS1 and y end is MDS2. Those are the values stored in vector. Some information about how we want our arrow to appear. And then we will add a label to that as well. We have the label as the gradient, which is stored in the vectors data frame in PCA scores. Now this is just some formatting stuff that is going to vary for each graph you make. You just need to play around with it, but I've moved the geom text, the label, back a bit from the endpoint of the arrow just so there isn't so much overlap. So I've just multiplied the endpoint of the arrow by 0.9, so this is going to extend 90% of the way out from the origin and I've given it a slight nudge so it moves away from that point and now we can just look at that ordination with the points for the site scores colored by group and we see our arrow going across there and with the scaling and the nudging we've done to the label for humus depth we have moved it away from the endpoint of the arrow. Let's add our spider plots to show the different groups instead of just points and colored points for our site scores. We use geom segment to draw from 
the centroid of each group out to the end, very similar as we did with the environmental vector. But here we're mapping to the spiders data frame in the PCA scores list. We'll put the points on top just to show what those endpoints are. The labels will go onto the centroids, and this will tell us what group is being plotted by each of those colors. Another option would be to use a legend, but since there isn't very much overlap from the centroids, it makes sense to just put the labels right on them. So we'll update our site's GG object and view it. This makes a pretty clean ordination plot that really fits the general theme of a ggplot graphic. One thing that we might do to improve it is wait until probably this point to plot the label for humus depth so that that could be plotted on top of those blue lines. You can see that a reason why we plotted the environmental vector first is if it laid on top of the spider plots it would go through the label for the summer burn season and it would be hard to read that but we plotted the arrow and its label at the same time we would actually rather plot the label last so it sits on top of the spider but we want the arrow to sit behind it we talked last time about how one of the most useful parts of an ordination versus, say, a cluster diagram is that we're able to see which of the species, or in this case nutrients, accounts for variation in the multivariate space that we see on the ordination projection. So with spring and summer being on opposite sides of the ordination, it's very reasonable that we want to know which nutrients are accounting for that variation. We show this by plotting the species scores, which we've stored in our PCA scores list as species, and we can simply use geom label to plot those as MDS1, MDS2, and then give the label the nutrient. These are some formatting options for geom label that help show contrast between the label and anything that might be plotted behind it. That looks as we might expect. One change that has occurred though is because aluminum and iron are so far out along the first MDS axis that we've created a lot of white space over here to the right and have scrunched up our ordination on the site scores to accommodate those high values on MDS1. We can scale the species scores back simply by multiplying the points in space by a value that's less than one. This doesn't change the nature of the information being presented. Yes, we are manipulating the site scores and changing their values, but by changing every one by the same factor, we haven't changed any of their relative information. So in interpreting which of the site scores is more strongly correlated with axis 1, say, or scores further along axis 2, all those relationships are preserved. We've just pulled the range in a little bit so that we can have less white space in our ordination. This is purely an aesthetic transformation. Store this as an object called biplotgg, and we can look at that. Now you can see that there's no meaningful difference in this ordination versus the previous graph, but we've eliminated this white space along the right focused on our site scores shown maximum variation among the site scores 
but we can also see where the species scores, the different nutrients fall in terms of that variation. In this example, we're pretty fortunate in that our species scores are relatively short and there aren't very many of them. We just have one or two characters and it's unlikely that any of these species scores are really going to clutter up the plot by adding them to our site scores. But that's actually rarely the case. Species names can be long, there can be a large number of species in a data set, and adding them can really make a mess of a biplot. One option is to make a separate graph of the species scores showing their relationships identified by the species and plot that beside the site scores with just a small character to indicate where the species are as a way to reference between the two graph panes. So to illustrate this let's create a new site score graph where we add the species scores just as points, little plus signs. This is exactly the same graph as before, but we don't have the species scores identified by name. We create a new ordination called species GG that is just those species scores on that original empty plot. This is one good reason for creating that org gg that we can fill with data later. We can use it as the base and easily add very different information with just one geom. Here we see the range of the MDS2 axis is shifted to accommodate the fact that most of the species scores are negative along axis 2 and nitrogen it's not very far into the positive space, but we can easily orient ourselves to the other graph by the little plus signs we made on the site score graph and the dotted lines that show 0, 0. And now we can actually look and see which species are accounting for the variation, particularly along MDS axis 1. Using the grid arrange function from the grid extra package, it's very easy for us to look at these side by side. We just give it those two ggplot objects that we created. If we want them side by side, we say n row equals one. We could say n call equals two. Or we could arrange them vertically. These are just design options that come to your preference. So we can run that. In these two panels side by side that are easy to reference from right to the left based on the origin, the dotted lines, and the small symbols for the species scores, we're able to convey a lot of information about variation in this data set by burn season, spring, fall, and summer, the nutrients, that account for that variability with calcium, zinc, magnesium, and potassium, phosphorus being more associated with summer burns, showing that summer burns are higher in those, and spring burns showing a relatively greater amount of iron and aluminum in these data. Remember, of course, I assigned these groups just purely for this example, there was no burn season in these reindeer grazing data in the Veracam data set. And we also have our humus depth vector showing that it's generally greater in the left side of the ordination versus the right. So this is a very clean way for us to use ggplot to present some of the potentially very busy and cluttered information that comes with testing many groups, gradients, and trying to show variation in ordination space when we're doing multivariate analyses.
Well, there you are. You know all about how to dig into ordination objects created with vegan, and there's no excuse for you to continue to make cluttered base plot ordinations in your manuscripts, thesis, and certainly not your presentations. There's a lot of responsibility on your hand to make ordinations interpretable when you're presenting them to an audience, particularly when you're giving a presentation in front of people. So think hard about what are the patterns in your multivariate data that you want to emphasize and use the tools of ggplot to highlight the patterns and information that you want to emphasize and remove or at least minimize the less important clutter. The lesson this week was brought to you by the following base functions. By plot, plot, text, the X11 window, summary, and screen plot. Guest appearances from packages tidyverse, particularly the select function, and vegan functions. Cap scale, scores, and already cluster. And as always, this lesson has been brought to you by the letter R. Some of this goes beyond the basics covered in Introduction to R, but as you just saw in the lesson before, we get a lot more out of the packages and functions of R when we can go into the objects created and use the pieces that we want and plot them in another package. That's just one example of how we can dissect R objects to pull out particular parts. Now I'm going to show you here a little bit about how we start to go into an R object, see what see what parts are in there, see what they do, and how we get them out for our purposes using several of the objects that we just fit before. I've added some script here to show how we can go into these different objects created by different packages and pull out the information that we need so that we can create our own little data frame or tibble and manipulate ggplot to show exactly the information we want in the same order, modify color, all that sort of stuff. You can do this for about anything in R. You just have to know how to go into an object and find where the information is stored and know how to pull that out. There's two main ways that we go about knowing where to look. The first comes to understanding what sort of object we have by calling the class function. Here we know that we fit the PCA using cap scale. The order of this is based on the development of the function cap scale. Cap scale is a particular form of the RDA function which in vegan is based on CCA. All RDAs in vegan and all cap scale operations in vegan simply modify the underlying script of CCA. It just makes vegan a little bit smaller in terms of the script and the program and more clean in not having to rewrite the functions and the algorithms for every single thing when the basic math for a lot of these operations it's fairly similar. So now that we know that cap scale objects are essentially CCA objects, we can call question mark CCA and go into the help file. An important component of the documentation for a object or function in R is the values that are returned. We're often used to looking at the arguments, their description, examples on how to use it, 
And we often scroll past the values, but this is what tells us what's in these objects that we create. And we can see here that Dr. Oksanen has told us that function CCA returns a huge object of class CCA, which is described separately in CCA object, which is linked here. So we can follow that, and this is great reading for anyone who wants to know more about how these functions work, which functions you should use, and the various arguments and how you should specify them. And so by anyone interested in that, I mean you, if you think you will be doing multivariate analysis in R with the vegan package. And so you can read all about in here what all the different parts of the CCA object are. And here are a bunch of functions for how we can pull a lot of things out of that or conduct other tests. Back to the script, the second way to know what is in an object is to actually look at its structure. And when we call structure on our PCA, we see what Dr. Oksanen was referring to of this being a huge object of CCA. There's a lot of stuff stored here. Note that it follows our list structure. This is a list of 14 objects. Some of these are rather small. This one is simply the number 2.39. This one is a vector with several attributes. The CCA is itself a list with several objects inside it. This is the meat and potatoes of the result but it's not quite sufficient for our purposes to extract information from it to draw our own ordinations in ggplot. We can use the nested dollar sign syntax that we discussed when talking about lists to map to parts of the PCA that we're familiar from some of our diagnostic summaries. These are the eigenvalues for each of the MDS axes, that's stored in the CA list in the CCA object. And these two other components, U and V, denote the objects that store the site scores and species scores. We can see our MDS1, MDS2, and our nutrients that were our columns or species in the PCA. However, it is important to know that even though our site scores and species scores come from these U and V objects that are buried in this vegan object, these are not the scores that we use to plot the ordination. These are the raw information that the ordination algorithm or equation that's programmed in R uses to create the ordination the ordination. These points will be scaled prior to creating the projection. We can use the scores argument to pull out what the projection actually uses for site scores and species scores respectively. And as we used in the script in the lesson, we can just convert that to a data frame and then as a tibble and move the nutrients from row names into its own column. And with this, we're ready to use ggplot to plot our species scores. It's very similar for our groups and gradient objects. We can look up what type of object we have in our humus depth vector we see that's and fit that makes sense that's the function we use so let's look that up go to its help file scroll past the description usage arguments and details and down here we see the value of these lists of classes vector fit and factor fit 
we are interested in arrow endpoints from vector fit. These are stored as arrows. And the centroids, of course, are calculated for the center of the different clusters or groups that we make in with 40 spider. That's from factor fit. Here we've tested vectors, so we want the arrows portion of this object for our vectors. And we can look just here at the structure of the argument. Indeed, we see everything that the value described. We have a list of three vectors. That is very full of information because we fit vectors only. Factors has null that is uh, empty. So we can map in here. We see our arrows portion, and we can see where the statistics were stored. There's the R value, P -val values, the number of permutations, all the sort of stuff that we're used to setting when we give arguments to a call to this function. Notice that it's a list of three, so we can call that vectors list itself. We see a list of five with the arrows in there, and those are what we want to get our endpoints for those arrows. Again, that's a list, and we're nesting our different lists in the object with additional dollar signs. You see that. And the scores function, because it works on vectors as well, is very useful in pulling that out just as, as we want it. So we use that same structure with the pipes to store the row names, hue depth, as a gradient that we tuck into our overall list of scores and objects that we're going to plot in ggplot. Now remember the gg or dplot object is nothing to do with vegan. It just works with vegan objects. It's just a list. Um, but when we look at that, the structure of that is very large. That's because it has a lot of ggplot information stored in it. The mapping, the position, setup, it's all this different stuff. This is all part to do with ggplot. The part we want, I mean, look, that's enormous. The part we want is at the top. Remember, we had talked about how the ordination groups, ellipses, holes, and spiders are all calculated automatically and then just stored in this object. See some basic information about the ordination there, x, y, and the groups, but we're particularly interested in the spiders component of that. And we can see the groups arranged there. We see the centroids, the same numbers here, of course, right? For fall, they share a centroid for the group and then unique endpoints for X and Y. And remember, we use the pipe and the rename function to change X and Y to MDS1 and MDS2 respectively so that it fits in the rest of the things that we've been storing when we want to plot the ordinations in ggplot.